Welcome to the outreach ministry of Bishop Victor Gill, Prophet of the Nation. Coming to you from the Caribbean paradise, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Join us right now for an experience that can change your life. Get ready for your miracle. Here is Bishop Victor Gill. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is a very classical passage, a very pivotal passage a very central passage of scripture. Jesus is talking on the subject of worship in our text. But the background of it, as you know, is the, the encounter he had with this Samaritan woman who was living a very topsy-turvy life and had had many husbands, many men in her life. And uh, Jesus was able to discern that. And as a result of that, she said, I perceive that you are a prophet. I perceive that you are a religious man. I perceive that you are a man of God. Because she knew that what Jesus told her was the truth. And immediately she began to talk about worship. She said, our fathers worship in this mountain. And you say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. She was a Samaritan. And the Samaritans, there was an argument between the Samaritan and the Jews as to which was the right place to worship. The Samaritan had a mountain called Gerizim. And so they were, they were, they were saying, this is the right place against the Jews who worshipped at Mount Moriah where the temple was. So she raised this argument. All fathers worship in this mountain. And you say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus responded and said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem Worship the Father. Before I even uh, deal with that, let me just say here also that, you know, this woman, as she was convicted, she raised the topic of worship. 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 Because worship is very central. Man was created to be a worshiper and a worshiper of God. And that is the reason why there are so many religions worshiping so many things because people want in their nature there's a desire to worship because God created man that way and so this woman her conversation with Jesus in this text reflects that reality she immediately began speaking about worship But I want us to observe the response of Jesus. Jesus said, You worship, you know not what you worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And then he said, But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Jesus said the time is coming when the true worshipers will neither worship God in Jerusalem nor in this mountain. So he was adding a dimension that she did not know about nor the Jews. This was something new. The hour comes and now is when 
The true worshipers will not worship God in this mountain or that mountain, but the true worshipers, Jesus said, will worship God in spirit and in truth. So again, I want to say to you, this subject of worship is the challenge of the, of the ages. It was the challenge that the first man, Adam faced, the first Adam. Who would you worship? And so his obedience, his subservience, his commitment, his faith, his trust, his faithfulness was challenging the garden. And Adam chose to bow down, as it were, to the devil. And gave his allegiance to the enemy by just putting his trust in him and obeying him, following his words instead of the word of God. Fast forward. Thousands of years after, and here is Jesus in the wilderness. And the devil says, the Bible said the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, look, if you will bow down, fall down before me and worship me, I will give them to you. And so you have to see that the issue of the centuries, the issue of the ages, is worship. Who or what you will worship or how would you worship? Jesus said, the hour comes when you will neither in this mountain nor that mountain worship the Father. You could think about many things that will relate to this mountain or that mountain. He tells us what God really wants because our worship is what defines us. Because you see, we didn't make ourselves, God made us, and God made us for Himself. Ever so often, we just think about ourselves. What can I get? What is in this for me? What, what fruit I could pick? What fruit I could bite? What is, where I could get my next bite? What can I eat and satisfy my stomach? Or my own personal interests, my own personal desires. But we were really made for God's pleasure. The Bible says all things were made by him. And for him. And for his pleasure. And so God made us. To worship him. To lord him. To eulogize him. To honor him. In, and, and watch this. To worship him. But to worship him in truth. If it's going to be in truth. It must be in spirit. So God really wants us to worship him in truth. And the big question is, what is that? So Jesus again said, the hour comes and now is when you will neither worship the father in this mountain or in Jerusalem. You worship, you know not what you worship. The hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Watch this. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. 
The God is seeking, he is craving, he is desirous, he is passionate about having people who will worship him the right way. Who will worship him the true way. Who will worship him in spirit and in truth. How many people tonight while we are here are worshiping? How many are bowing down to Buddha? How many are bowing down to a man? To Selassie I? To Mr. Moon? To the wafer in the monstrance? 300 million gods in India. And then, even in the church today, how many are really worshiping God in that way that he wants? Jesus said, the Father is seeking such to worship him. Oh, the Father is looking. Especially in these last days, good things are rare. I mean, you can hardly get a good ripe banana. How much a good ripe Christian? How much? How about that? A true worshiper. Everything is makeup. I mean, I have colognes that I just have out to throw away. Some of the most expensive colognes. It's just water. No matter how I spray them, I can't get a cent. Talking about the best name. And I compare them with, a, with some five dollars that I five dollars perfume that I pick up, and they are smelling ten times better. I'm not making this up. There's a lot of fake stuff going around. I bought a jacket, a leather jacket, because I was going to travel online on Amazon. When it came down, what I saw in the picture, what they sent is something totally different. I called Amazon. I said, hello. Look the picture here. Look what I got. It looked the same color, but this is not it. They said, you are, good. You are a good customer. We will refund you. You can keep the jacket. And I still have it. If you wanted, I could give it to you. But that's not my stuff. And I feel today that God is probably facing the same kind of, the, of dilemma. He is seeking for the genuine. Not the fake. He's seeking for true worshippers. True worshippers. People who will not worship him like a God, but the God. Not like some little statue in a corner, but the God who created the whole universe. The God in whom we live and move and have our beings. The God who knew you a million years before you were conceived in the womb of your mother and decided, I want you here and decided when you will leave and there ain't no devil, there ain't no power that can change that. That God who is king over devils, king over the devil himself, king over angels, Lord of all creation, almighty God, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, God full stop. One that is inexplainable. He's looking for true worshippers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And I'm saying this is the first and last challenge. The first challenge that, the, the challenge the first Adam faced and the challenge the last Adam faced. Who would you worship? How would you worship? What would you worship? I want to show you something very important here. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. This is the Ten Commandments. I want to show you that there are two kinds, something probably you never saw in the Bible. There are two different kinds of idolatry in the Bible. And if you don't understand that, 
You could miss what God is saying concerning worship in spirit and in truth. Notice the Ten Commandments. It says, you shall have no other God before me. That's the first. And the first is the premier. It's most important. That's God's concern. Don't have any other God before me. Then, the second is, you shall not make to yourself, you shall not make to you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, you may think that that is just a, you know, a comment on the first one and it is the same. So I want to prove to you before I go forward that it is not the same. So we can get some light and understanding of what true worship is about. So if you look at number, verse 3, you shall have no God, no other gods before me. That's number one. I want to show you the Ten Commandments. Number two, you shall not make to yourself any graven image. Number three, verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Number five, verse 12, sorry, uh, number three is, number four is verse eight. Number three is verse seven. Number five is verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives. Number six is what? You shall not kill. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight. You shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not be a false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. So, so this is to prove to you that in, in chapter 3 and verse 4, they are not speaking in verse, rather verse 3 and 4 of chapter 20 of this passage. They are not speaking of the same thing. It is telling us that there are two different kinds of idolatry. Hear me. The idolatry about making an idol and bowing down to it is not the only kind of adult, uh, uh, idolatry. The, the idolatry, let me say it again, of making an idol, or even if you don't make it, but you bow down to one that is already made, is the same, it's idolatry. But that is not the only form of idolatry. As a matter of fact, it is not the worst. And that is a commandment by itself. It is the second commandment. Anybody with me? The first commandment is the first form or kind and the most deadly and insulting idolatry to God. And all God said is this. You shall have no other God before me. Let me read it from the, from, the, from the Bible. You shall have no other gods, plural, before me. That means, listen what it means. Whatever you put before me is a God. That broadens the field. If you put food, sex, clothes, money, friends, and, or yourself, anything you put before me is an idol. And an idol is something you worship. Worship, watch this, it's not just raising your hands. To really worship God in spirit and in truth. To worship God, period. You don't just raise your hands, but you raise holy hands. The raising of your hands is like raising your life to God. Presenting your life and saying, 
I am your servant. I am obedient. I am clean. I did what you told me to do. No, I worship you. To, to, to raise the hand you steal with. To raise the hand you do all a lot of crooked things with. And your life is on your own beat, doing your own thing, running wild. And raising to God is like spitting in God's face. It is it's this hypocrisy to the highest level. It is deceit. It is wickedness. That's why the Bible says when you lift your hands, lift holy hands or keep it at your side. So that is why in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul gave a list of sins and he mentioned covetousness, which is idolatry. It says, mortify your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is what? Idolatry. Anything you put before God, anything you love more than God is an idol. So what Jesus meant when he said God is looking for worshipers who will worship the Father in spirit and in truth is that God is looking for people who will surrender their lives to him. Who will give him what he wants. What he's asking for. You must have no other God before me. Let me be God in your life. Approach my word that way. Then you don't have to wonder what it is you need to do to worship him as your God because he clearly says love me with all your heart he clearly says if you come unto me and love anything more than me and if you don't uh, deny even yourself he said you cannot follow me he said listen I want you to pray always and not faint I want you to hunger and thirst after righteousness he said I don't want you to be lukewarm I don't want you to be neither hot nor cold I want you to be on fire and he said I don't want you to to have your love up one level and then drop it down to another you know I recognize that uh, we must never we must never move from the highest peak of our spiritual fervor, find a plane below the highest level that you have been on and think you can be right with God. That is equivalent. In other words, God saying, there must be never a retrogression. There must be a progression. Don't leave your first love, but advance beyond the first love. Don't be neither hot no coal. Now when this, all these things that the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. All these things that the Bible speaks about. Here what will happen when you realize that, you know, if you are a true worshiper of God, your passion therefore will not be, what can I get from God? But what can I do for God? What can I be for God? Because hear me, God is able to take care of you. The problem is not whether God can provide. Where were you when God created? to the world. Where were you when God said, earth come forth, sun come forth, moon come forth, stars come forth. Where would you be when God said, this is your last day. Thy soul is required of you. Who has the final say? Who says to nation, you are going to come off the scene? Who say, said to Rome, you're going to be a thought a, a thought of the past. Who said to Persia, you're gonna, your pride is going to be nothing. Who said to Babylon, in one day you will fall. 
the two levied gates will be left open and Cyrus will take over. Who said to Nebuchadnezzar, tonight, your, today your kingdom is taken from you. Who said to Belshazzar while he was reigning in power, you have been weighed in the balance and have been found wanting. The gatekeeper of Trinidad and Tobago and the United States and Canada is not an army of soldiers, but Jehovah Sabaoth, the God of the armies of heaven. It is this God I am talking about that is calling upon us to worship him in spirit and in truth. So if you're going to be true, a true worshiper of God, then you've got to know who is God. You've got to have a concept of God because that is the only way you, can be, you would be able to step out on his word. And let me tell you something. You don't need no rhema word. You don't need no special word coming down from heaven like Paul. All you've got to do is read Paul. Read Paul's word. Read the Bible and say, God, if you said it, I'm going to step out on it. If you said it, I'm going to do it. If you said it, that's enough for me. For I've read it in the Bible. Amen. The word of God is quick and powerful. The word of God is alive. I have read in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. I've read in the Bible that the word of God says by two immutable things. One, that it is impossible for God to lie. And secondly, he made an oath to keep his word to what you and I I don't have to worry about what I'm going to eat and what I'm going to wear and what I'm going to put on for my heavenly father knows that I have need of all these things and he says even before you pray I know and while you are calling I will answer amen the Lord says for I've graven you upon the palm of my hands and I will not forget you I will not, uh, amen, uh, sleep nor slumber concerning you. You are the apple of my eyes. But what I want you to do is to recognize that I am God. Amen. You don't have to try to take nothing from nobody. You don't have to jealous nobody. You don't have to fight to get anything. All you got to do is serve God. All you got to do is bow down and worship. Are you going to put your all on the altar and lay it out before me? Are you going to seek me the way? I ask you to seek me for no man will seek me and find me until he search for me with all, my, with all his heart. That is a principle by the way. We appreciate the time you spent with us today. If you need prayer right now, send us an email to info at victorgill.org or call now at 1-868-266-1830 and we will pray for you to get your miracle. You can partner with Bishop Gill to bring healing to the nations by donating any amount at www.victorgill.org. Thank you. From our family to you, God bless you richly.